Hey guys, it's Cam here. Welcome back to the build room. In this week's episode, we are taking on a leaking steering rack in my 1999 R34 Skyline. So stick around and check it out. Okay, so before we get into today's episode, just a note for all of you Build Room fans that have been there since the get-go, we are getting back to Celica content soon, all right? I promise you that. We've got a couple more things to tidy up on the Skyline, and then we're gonna do a little bit of paint on one of my uh, current cars so I can actually move that on. And then we are gonna get do for now back in the garage, work on the bodywork, and then after that, this bad boy is gonna get the new rear end welded on and then we are going to raptor coat the entire underbody and um, we should be ready to start some proper bona fide body work. So yeah, all of that is coming up and I'm hoping uh, the Skyline content is interesting enough to keep you watching in the meantime. But for now, we're back to the Skyline. So this thing's steering rack leaks like a son of a bitch. Um, it is destroying my new driveway, which I'm not too happy about. And being respectful of other people's stuff, I can't really take it anywhere that I'm not looking to destroy what I'm parking on there either. So, it's got to be fixed. So yeah, um, we have the car up on jack stands already. Um, taking the wheels off, so we should have plenty of access. We're going to jump underneath now and see exactly how bad this job is going to be because um, this would be the first time that I've ever done a steering rack and certainly ever done one on an R34. So uh, yeah, I'm going to be learning everything from scratch today. So hopefully it goes well. It could all go pear shaped and this thing could be uh, stuck up on jack stands until I can find a replacement steering rack, but we will see. For now, let's jump onto the car and see what we're working with. All right, so this is the steering rack. Uh, it's a little bit hard to see, but uh, yeah, everything from the tie rod end down there all the way to the tire end on the other side and connecting into the steering shaft just up there. Now you can already see there's a lot of fluid on the outside of this unit. So there are definitely some seals leaking here. There's also some other funky stuff. So this here, this seems to be some black plastic that's been put there. Now I don't know whether there was a shield that's supposed to be there and it's missing or whether this has been done to mask the fact that there is a leak from the rack, uh, I don't know. I mean, this isn't really fooling anyone. I mean, you can only, it doesn't take long to see that there's a lot of fluid coming out of this thing. But uh, yeah, we'll get this off and we'll see uh, what the situation is up here. Hopefully no damage and it's just someone trying to get this thing licensed or something without fixing the rack. It's just held on with a zip tie here, uh, a Phillips head and one nut. All right, and with that off, uh, I guess the only thing you can really see here, there doesn't look to be any damage, but uh, certainly a lot more oil. And funnily enough, the thing that was blocking this up looked like the side of a container of oil, like a five liter oil container uh, that had been cut and then it had absorbent material put inside it to soak some of this up. So I would say that was definitely a sneaky way to try and get this thing registered without fixing a steering rack leak. So yeah, the big thing for me on this one is, am I gonna be able to get the steering rack out without having to move the position of the engine? So this bolt here and there's one here um, once they're undone we should be able to lift up the keepers on the rack and then we can remove it from the steering shaft there and both of the tie rod ends on either side of the car and we should be able to move this out but it depends on whether it's going to foul so i have a feeling these reinforcing plates for the gearbox i think they might need to go that way we can sort of drop it out the back of this thing and not have a problem um, but if we end up having to sort of raise the engine up in order to get this out it makes it a bit more difficult proposition so yeah the only way we're going to know is to start disconnecting things so what i'm going to do is i'm going to leave the fluid system alone for now mainly because i don't want to sit in a uh, puddle of oil so i'm going to start with the tie rod ends and the uh, steering shaft there. We'll also get a lot of the heat shields or anything else like that that looks like it needs to come out in order to get this thing clear. And then we will pull those fluid lines. You can see them just around the front of the pump there. We'll pull those fluid lines off, which is gonna get the floor wet. And then hopefully this thing will slide out. So let's start by giving this thing a good clean down so that I don't end up getting covered in fluid and then get into it.
All right, and the reason I took those off at the uh, end of the arm rather than the tie rod is that I don't want to risk damaging the boots because these tie rod ends are sweet. Um, and I know we're messing up the alignment here, but when we're going to take these off and then replace them with new ones, um, we're going to have to not have a tie rod end on it anyway. When you are pulling it off though, just try and keep the adjustment nuts close to where they are. That way, when you put it back together, you can set it close to what it was originally and then take it down to an alignment shop to get it done professionally and make sure you don't camber wear your tires. All right, so we've got the rack out of the car. Uh, I've thrown it on the bench here and um, just given it a really good clean up with some degreaser. Uh, and you know what? It doesn't look too bad at all. Uh, these were the bushes, or at least that's half a bush and that's the full bush. The round one goes over here on this end and this one is one part of a clamshell that sits over here. Now that has a metal shell inside the bush. I'm not sure if you can see that there, but yeah, that's metal inside, so that's pretty heavy duty, um, but it is a little bit chewed up. So I do have some replacements for both of these, um, and I've got, obviously, in addition to the seal kit that's going to go through this, I've also got some new boots for the ends here. So yeah, that was a pretty easy process to get this out of the car. I'm actually really happy with it. Now, before we get into tearing this thing apart, uh, there is one thing that I want to do, and that's going to save us a little bit of hassle down the line, and that is to make sure that I am aware of which rod end is on which end of the rack, and also the distance from this screw, or this nut, to the end of the arm, so that when we put this back together, we can get it roughly close. Because if you don't pay attention to where these are, when you put it back together, the toe's not gonna be correct, and it's not gonna drive properly. Now, no matter what you do, you're gonna have to get an alignment after you do this, but at least this way, um, it won't be a horrible experience to drive it down to get that alignment done. And to make sure I get it right, all I'm gonna do is, unwind this nut until it comes all the way off and I'm gonna count the number of turns on the way out and then I'll make sure I just mark down the driver's side number of turns and the passenger side number of turns and when we put it back together, we'll try and get it to that spot. So yeah, I'll just do that quickly and then we will start pulling this thing apart. Two, three, 26, 27, 27 and a quarter maybe at best, probably just 27 is fine. 29, 30. All right, so now I wanna get the uh, rack boots off just so we can see what's underneath them. I actually think the steering rack itself is in pretty good nick. So yeah, first things first, we'll get these seals out of the way. Clamp on the outside. And then there are these um, CV clamps. I don't know what they're actually called. Um, and I think they're a single use. You have a special crimping tool that gets them on. Um, the normal steering boots that you see uh, when you buy replacements, you normally get these big 
long pieces of metal wire and you wrap them around and basically just twist it off. Um, it's actually an easy way to tell if someone's been into these racks uh, because standard they'll have these and usually if someone's replaced the boot, it'll have the wire. I actually like these things, so I might actually try and get some of these and replace them with stock ones, but my boots did come with a twisty wire. All right, that's off. You can see in there, there's actually quite a bit of fluid. So yeah, I'm just gonna clean this one up and then we'll get the other one off. Ooh, a little bit of fluid in that one too. All right, now I'm gonna take the two fixed hydraulic lines off. Um, just use a flare nut wrench for that one. And it's a 12. <sighs> two, three. <sighs> and four. Okay, them to the side. And now in the rack and peanut steering here, we have the rack, which has the tooth arm that goes through it. And then this area here, which houses the pinion gear. Now we'll take off the steering shaft seal. And there's a couple of little E type bolts that hold the pinion housing on. And they're actually E10 bolts. Now I might have to put this in the vise, we'll see. Yeah, let's go to the vise. One, two. Now here's the interesting part. I've seen a similar rack dismantled like a um, 180SX rack or a 240SX if you're in the US. And it has four rubber seals down the pinion and I didn't get them in my seal kit. So um, we're about to find out whether I have a chance in hell of doing this with the parts I have or whether we need to order more. All right, looks like the whole, the whole pinion arm is gonna come out of this. So that's actually got pressure on it from this um, retainer here. Uh, this basically adjusts the preload. So I might, oh, no, I can get it out. It's got a bit of grease in the teeth, but doesn't look too bad. Moves pretty well. All right, so we've got that apart now. Um, that was a little bit tight, but all I did was basically just on the metal surface here, hold the edges and tap down on the top of the shaft, um, which knocked it out quite easily. Uh, and then inside what I was hoping I wouldn't see, but yeah, this seems like a setup, which is very similar to the S13 steering racks, uh, in that it has four seals here. Um, it, they're really hard to see because they're dark seals on that, but yeah, you can just see the, the lighter, stuff here each one of those is a seal and then there's a seal at the top here on the pinion um, and i don't have any of those uh, i also don't have inside the pinion housing i don't think that i have this seal here uh, which is held in by a bearing and you can see if it'll focus in on that this is a koyo bearing made in japan it's probably the original one uh, and then there's a seal behind it um, and i may be able to reuse the bearing but i definitely should replace the seal so um, what I'm going to have to do here to get seals for these things is, um, like I said, none of the seals are listed on the Nissan website. In fact, if you go to Amiyama or something like that, um, you'll see that they show you these four on the parts diagram and this one, but they only give you a part number for this entire unit altogether. Uh, meaning they mustn't sell those seals separately. So what I'm gonna do is take this to a local um, powering steering rack specialist. They should have um, these sorts of square sided seals. They may be exactly the same as the 181 and I might be able to order them, but um, I really need these now. So getting them local is better. And also um, you never know. So I could order 181s for this and then they could arrive and be slightly bigger or smaller. So yeah, just to make it easy for the guys down at the uh, steering rack place, I'm gonna take this seal out. And I think you guys probably wanna see how to get that out as well. So I'll take the, um, the bearing and the seal out and then we'll take this whole lot down and we'll see what we can get replaced. To get this out, I'm gonna drive both the seal and the bearing out at the same time, I hope, with just a socket. This is a 16 mil socket. 
um, and it kind of fits in there as long as it's small enough to go uh, inside the um, housing but big enough to catch the seal on the way through you should be okay and we're just going to hammer this out all right we're getting there Ta-da! Now, I'll see if I can read this. That looks like a one or an I, probably an I, 9YM3206VH bearing. So usually with those sorts of numbers, you can look that up on the system and you can get a replacement bearing if you don't know the part number. And this is my seal. Now this is obviously now mangled. Um, the thing to note is uh, this way was up. So on these seals, you have an area that is open. See, um, there's two layers there and this back area is open. And then the top, which is sealed. The reason being is um, the actual pressure of the fluid gets in here and expands the seal. So this is always the pressure side. All right. So we've got those two parts. Let's go see if we can get replacements. All right, before we do, uh, I just got to get the tire ends off because these plates are important. So we'd normally just take these off with a couple of spanners, but we're going to have to lever the locking plates off just with the screwdriver. These are single use, so don't be afraid to bend them. And then with just a spanner and a set of vice grips. All right. All right. So we've chewed that up a little bit with the uh, vice grips. I just didn't have a thin enough um, spanner to get onto the end of that, but it's loose. The, uh, the actual ball joint itself feels like it's in pretty good nick, so I'm not gonna bother replacing these at this point. But what I need is that little clip. So there we go. We just need two of those. Now I'm going to take off the retainer um, adjustment nut. Uh, so I think we'll just loosen that off and then um, we'll take this out. All right, that's loose. This should back out now, nice and easy. There's really no pressure on this at all. Now there's a spring under here, so just be aware of that. I don't know if it's going to fire out, but we'll see. All right, feels pretty loose. Yep, okay, so retaining nut. And then inside, let's have a close whoop. Put that back so that we can see it in its natural form. We have a spring here. There's a lot of garbage in that, but yep, yeah, it's our spring. And then in here we have what should be our sort of plunger mechanism. The best way to get this out might be from the inside of the rack. All right, we'll try some circlet pliers. That might do the job. There we go. All right, and that is our retainer. All right, and that is basically just a smooth, uh, probably nylon or something surface, designed to put pressure on the rack um, just to take, just to put some preload on it. All right, now it's time to get the main part of the rack out. And to do that, we need to get the retaining nut that is on the passenger side off. Zoom right in on that. There's an area that looks, I think it's punched from the factory with like a um, square or a rectangular punch. And that is designed to make sure that this can't undo. Um, you can drill these out. Some people say drill them out and things like that. But from what I understand, you can also just back the nut off. And this nut is strong enough to um, uh, just move past this and push it back out if you're putting a reasonable amount of pressure on it. So I don't want to start drilling into this and running the risk of um, A, drilling too far or getting metal shavings into this body. So we're just going to try and undo it and see how I go. And if it won't move, then we might have to come up with a plan B. Oh, <laughs> all right. So yeah, as soon as it got past that punched area, it's been fairly, it's now fairly easy to move. You can still feel a little bit of drag, but the threads will hopefully be okay when we get this out. 
All right, now I've taken this out a little bit and it actually looks like we're damaging the threads here. So um, it seems that what I read about that being able just to open up is not true. So um, I don't want to back this out all the way and then have busted threads for the whole thing. So I'm going to tighten it back up. I'm going to drill that piece out and we'll try again. That's it. <laughs> Not the other one. All right, I think that's removed enough metal from that to sort of make sure that it, it will hopefully just bend slightly out of the way as the thread of the nuts go through it. So I'm gonna have another crack at backing this off. We'll move, if I can get it to the point where it's not gonna interfere with the threads, that's where I want it to be. All right, we're just gonna to have to send it, I guess. All right, so, man, that's not great, but um, I managed to take out almost half the thread. That's disappointing, but I mean, there's still some of the thread left. It's not gone completely, but uh, yeah, that is not ideal. That is a bit of a fail, but there's not much we can do. Just gonna keep moving. All right, so we've got everything out now and partially cleaned up uh, as good as it needs to be at the moment. Um, so uh, here is a quick overview of the power steering setup. And as far as I know, and bear in mind, I'm not an expert, um, this is kind of how it works. So anyway, you have a hydraulically assisted power steering rack. That is the rack and pinion. So this toothed area here uh, engages with the pinion so that when you turn your steering left and right, it basically walks this rack back and forwards. And that gives you your steering. Now, that would be very heavy in a one and a half, two ton plus car. Uh, not that the R34 is that heavy, but you get my drift. So then you add a hydraulic pressure system to assist that movement and make it a little bit easier on the driver. Now, the way that works is on the pinion, you have a complicated valve body there and you can see the holes in that valve body and the seals in between them. And basically the motion of the rotation of the steering wheel uh, affects the pressure that goes into each of these two pipes. Now inside this, we have the rack mounted normally, and this area here lines up with, this piece here sits in between these two pipes and they push pressure in at different levels. Uh, this rubber seal would normally be out at the end of the rack and that's why, again, you can see the open part of the seal there is on the inside towards the middle of the rack. So that seals up and stops fluid going past it out of the rack. Um, and then you have this seal here, which is actually, I believe it's Teflon coated. It's quite a hard seal, but that sits on the walls. And that's basically one side of your power steering and then the other, which means if you're looking at this, they're not even, why? because inside here, there is a piece of metal, and I think it's about there. Um, and on that piece of metal, there is another one of these seals flipped the other way around to seal and stop power steering fluid coming through that way. And what that means is when you have a pressure differential in one of these, it's gonna wanna push this piston left or right. So higher pressure here, low pressure here, and it's gonna wanna push the rack that way uh, and vice versa. So yeah. Power steering fluid under pressure here. Also, power steering fluid under pressure all around the valve body, which is why you have a seal here at the bottom and a seal here in the top. Um, and I don't think there's normally much leakage through this area. Obviously, my seals are worn, so there is, but um, I think that's why you grease this up and you grease this up so that they're not wearing each other and then you're not relying on a sealed power steering fluid in here to stop that wear. So what that means for us is two things. Firstly, we can take this seal off. So this just comes straight off the rack, no problemo. And then I want you to picture another seal in about there on the rack and we have to get that one out. So how do we do that? Obviously it's quite far down the rack. We really need to make sure we don't scratch this area here. The area on this side is a little less sensitive to scratching, but still you don't wanna scratch it anyway. So we are gonna to have to make a tool to get this seal out of here so that we can get the new one in. So I'm gonna use this to help me create my template for the tool. And I'm gonna try and do this easily. I have seen, um, there's a guy named Tony240, I think. I've watched his video on this and he welds 
uh, the end of like a pick to a piece of metal and manages to get it down the rack and then he pushes it from the other side and stuff and he gets it out. Um, I'm trying to make this as easy as possible for someone with limited tools to follow. So being able to weld a stainless steel pick onto a metal rod is not ideal for a lot of people. So we're gonna try something a little bit more low tech. And I have here a piece of scrap metal uh, that I had lying around. It's just a square hollow section. And we're gonna just trim this up in a fashion that hopefully we can get a hook on the end of it that's gonna go in and just slip between this seal and the metal end. And then with the seal, what I'm gonna do is, I don't know if this is gonna work, right? But anyway, I'm gonna to check to make sure that once it's in, even if I push it down all the way, I can't scratch the surface. So you can see that where it is now, that edge sits just proud. So that would drag a nice big scratch all the way down. So we're gonna cut it back to about there. I'm gonna check that again. There we go, as long as we're pulling on this and not banging anywhere else, we should be okay. So then I'm just going to give it a quick sand down to make sure there's not too many rough edges on it. Hopefully you guys can see that. I think that's pretty good. Now it's only thin folded metal, but it's got a fair bit of pull there. You know, I'd have to get the pliers back on there to bring that back out. So yeah, I think uh, what I'm gonna do is wrap this with some tape and then we'll give it a shot. On this side, you can fairly clearly see that there is that black rubber seal there that we are going to have to get out. All right, so sit rep. Uh, it has been hours and hours and hours uh, that I have been working on this. And we are skipping ahead because I'm not gonna punish you guys by making you watch that crap. So what has happened is that I have got the seal out but it was an absolute nightmare and I'm gonna show you why and then what you should probably do and really not replicate my mistakes. So what happened, uh, I have here the seal that came out of the easy side and I've cut it up so that I can show you uh, what went wrong. So this seal, when it was intact, was sitting against that shelf, that metal shelf inside. And when I got the pick behind it, I didn't get it behind all the way. So if we have a look in here, so you can really see that there is a recess just there and this white ring sits inside it. And I would say that's to give the rubber, uh, make the rubber a little bit more firm. And then the spring sits around the whole shooting match so that when uh, you have a shaft coming through here, the spring applies pressure and it seals up. My issue was basically the first time I managed to get the picking hook in here I didn't get it behind the seal. So we have that metal lip here that the seal sits against. And the idea was to get the pick in between the metal and the rubber seal. And what I did, I actually managed to get the hook in between the rubber and this white piece of plastic. And I pulled this piece of plastic out of the seal, which left a lip, which left that big trench wide open that as I tried to get the pick in, for starters, it always wanted to end up there and being hard to see, you couldn't really get it in or out. But what happened was I started just to ruin the integrity of this inner part of the seal. And it was literally just ripping pieces of plastic off this as it went, um, ruining the seal and really ruining my chances of getting this thing out easily. So I ended up going down a rabbit hole of research and I found there is a tool that um, steering, there's a tool that the steering rack guys use to rebuild these things. And that basically puts a, um, almost like a reverse gear puller in there, expands it out and then pulls the seal. Which means when you've got as much strength here as you would on a good seal, it can pull it out relatively easy. If you wanna use the hook method, you need a strong hook and you need to make sure you get it behind um, or you can try and hire one of the actual tool removers to do that. Because I had ripped this seal to shreds, my ability to go and hire one of those tools and use it was pretty much nil too, because I had lost the edge that that tool needs to sit behind. So what I had to do was go extreme. 
I ended up getting a solid piece of square steel and then I had to fashion it into a point. So I just cut a 45 on it to a corner. So I ended up with quite a nice little point on it there. Nothing too sharp. And then if you see, I polished the corners of it so that it was very, very smooth. There's no sharp areas here that we're gonna gouge the inside of the steering rack. So then I was able to slide this down, get it situated exactly where I want to at the base of the seal like that. And yeah, I hit it pretty hard and I basically folded in the edge of the seal. And so this is what I ended up with. Uh, you can see that that has taken a large number of hits. I folded it all the way around. Um, and then when it was folded up like this, then it was very easy to get out. I got the hook, hook into here and it only took a really light tug and it basically fell out all the way. I managed to get it to a point where it now looks like this. So you can see down the end there, that's where the seal has to sit. And I've had a good look at this and I even used the uh, bore scope down there. Um, but yeah, it is very, very luckily, I wouldn't say out of skill, I would say pure luck. It is not scratched and there's really no scratches down the length of the bore either. So I'm hoping we are good to go. But yeah, I wouldn't rely on that strategy. Um, definitely take your time and make sure you have the pick well placed as you start pulling on the seal. Uh, that way you won't replicate my error. And ideally, if you have access to one or you can hire one cheap, uh, it'd be worthwhile hiring the tool that they use to remove it. Or get the rack out and get it to this point so there's only one seal left to go. Take it down to someone. They'll probably charge you 20 bucks to pull the seal out and then leave you on your way. But yeah, it's out for me. I'm really happy that we managed to hopefully salvage this operation. Uh, lessons learned for you guys and for me if I ever do this again. So let's keep moving through the project. We're almost finished with this assembly. There is literally two more parts over on the bench there that have still got seals in them. We're gonna pull them out now and then we're gonna clean everything up and start the reassembly process. All right, so now we've got the valve body. Similar situation again. I don't really wanna risk scoring this up too much. So I'm just gonna cut these ones too. Hopefully, not cut my finger. All right, so they're, they're actually quite um, brittle as well, or quite stiff rather. Um, not a standard style O-ring. Two, three, four. All right, and that brings us to this final seal here. Now this is the lower pinion seal and there is a bearing behind it. Um, and there is this weird sort of clamped on retaining ring here. I'm not sure if that is what has to come out so that we can remove the bearing and then remove the seal or whether the standard thing to do is to drill out this. That looks like a stainless steel dowel in there so that the valve body can slide down and then we can get that seal off, replace the seal, replace the bearing, slide it back together and put a new dowel into it. Yeah, so I just don't know on that one and there is no good information that I can find on the internet. So um, I'm gonna have to have a think about this. I might go and get some advice on it and um, I'm gonna come back and uh, we will pick up where we left off. All right, so we're back. I have the pinion valve body and uh, a little bit of a story to tell. So. I took this to a uh, power steering specialist because at the end of the day, I just wasn't sure how to get this thing apart. Um, the kit that I've got for the gaskets actually came with a metal ring and that metal ring is about the right diameter and the right size to slip over here and then be crushed on. So I think um, there is the possibility of removing that ring and crushing this one on, but you'd have to have that specialized tool and things like that. And obviously I don't have it. I wondered if they had it, but we also had that dowel pin there and we also have a dowel pin in the end through the torsion bar. Now I went in there, I was pretty friendly. I just asked them, you know, how I would sort of pull this apart. They were pretty hesitant or the guy was pretty hesitant to give me any information about it. Um, which I understand, he's running a business. Uh, you don't want people coming in and just asking you how to do work and then going away and doing it themselves. I was happy to pay him um, to do it for me, which got it done. Uh, I was hoping he was gonna give me a bit of information on how to do it after that point, but it was still pretty tight lipped. But we did have a quick conversation and I think I kind of get the gist of it. So uh, let's take a closer look at this on the bench and I can tell you what I think was done. So yeah, in the end, we have the crush ring there. I don't think that was removed. 
Um, from what I understand, what he did was he actually removed this pin here and when it came back, it had a little bit of copper grease around it. So I think he lubed it up to get that back in. So I'm pretty sure what needs to happen here is you punch that pin through or press it through. I think that'll be quite tight. You'll probably need a press. And then once that pin is out, then you can slide the valve body and this shaft here off the torsion bar, which is that piece there. And if you can see, um, right on the end of it, I'll see if I can get it to focus on that. You can see that he actually marked the alignment. Um, there's a mark that's been put in there and a mark on the uh, housing itself to line those two back up. So I, I definitely think he's taken that pin out, slid this off and then been able to replace this seal. So this is the new seal, I gave him that um, and he's just put it back in um, and reassembled and cleaned it all up for me and stuff like that. So. That was $75 to have him do that. Um, and I don't know how long it took him or anything like that, but money well spent considering I just wasn't sure which of these I should be trying to take apart. Anyway, it's back together and that's all I need. So what I've done is just cleaned the whole bench top down uh, and I've put some very clean core flute up. Want to stay really clean in the reassembly process so I don't risk getting any dust or you know, with the amount of grinding that I've done here over the years, uh, any metal shavers and stuff like that in. So um, already a little bit of stuff has fallen onto this. I'll just clean it up. We'll get all the bits we need and we will get cracking on this reassembly. All right, so we got everything in place. We've got our main steering rack and the bar that goes inside it. Um, I've got plenty of power steering fluid. Um, the R34 I think needs about a liter but we're gonna use it for assembly lube and when we're bleeding, we might spill some or whatever. So I've got a couple of liters for that. We've got some grease, which needs to grease up this gear and the pinion as it goes through. Uh, we have some dental floss, which I will explain in a minute. Um, some electrical tape. We've got some gasket maker. I don't think we'll need that, but I also have Loctite and some thread sealant because we do need thread sealant for the um, adjustment bolt. Uh, a soft blow hammer. Uh, this is to knock the bar through without damaging it too much. And then we've got our seal kit. Now, this seal kit is what you get if you order the genuine Nissan rack seals, but it is only seals, as I said, for this portion of the rack. So we have the two seals that go, one in this end and one here. Well, actually, it's more like about there, I think. Um, and then these two, which go on the center of the actuating rod. This is the kit that I got for the full kit, and that is a PSP kit, which is Power Steering Parts of Australia. Uh, and the kit is a PSK1025. If you contact PSP, I think they're pspa.com.au, they do have a list of all the seal kits and you can pick one up from them. So uh, yeah, I'm gonna glove up for this. I am gonna get power steering fluid everywhere and grease everywhere, I'd imagine. So um, I'm gonna try and stay as clean as possible. Um, but yeah, let's get into it and see how difficult it is. We're going to start by getting these two onto the main rod. Now, if you remember when we pulled this apart, it has the rubber O-ring that sits underneath this hard seal. And this seal here is actually quite inflexible plastic, so uh, it can be hard to get on there from what I understand. Hopefully I don't break it, but at least if I do, I've got a second one in the kit. I'm going to use the genuine Nissan seals where I can and then use the more generic ones wherever I don't have Nissan seals. I'm just going to dip this stuff into the power steering fluid. And that way, when we go to slide this on, it should be relatively easy to get on. Yep. And same with this one. Now, this has some reliefs in it, but they're both at 180 degrees. So I don't think this matters which way it goes on, just that you get it over fluid on that one as well. Yeah, and that is quite tight, but it's also deforming a little bit. Hmm. All right, I'm gonna try and just give it a little bit of a stretch. Almost there. I just wanna make sure that I don't mess this up as it goes in. So what I, what's happened here is it's just pops. You can see here, if I, if I have you that in the right. So if that's in the right angle, you can see it sits nice and flat. It's exactly what we want. And then just as we come across the crest where it's flipped over, it's kind of just caught on the edge. So I just need to get that to pop in on that. Which, okay, I'm just gonna try and pop it back out and try that again. What I might do this time is just put some floss underneath this so that I can pull it out to reposition it 
as I move it around. But that is quite a tight seal. All right, so with the floss in there, what I was able to do is just lift it up to get it over the square edge and then drop it in vertically. And then if I can pull that out. All right, now we've got a seal that seems to be sitting in there properly. Hopefully I haven't stretched it too much taking it off, but we'll find out as soon as we try to put it in the housing anyway. Now the next one we're trying to get in is the one that sits sort of in the center of the rack or close to the center of the rack. And this is the one that we had to fold up with that piece of metal bar at the end of the day and have it come out, um, which wasn't the best way to do it, but drastic times required drastic measures. So that one, we want the spring facing inside the rack, which means it goes springs in on the end of the rack. Now, there's a lot of serrated metal here. It's probably a bad idea to get this nice new seal and run it down all of those to get it to this point, which is where we'll need it to be because we'll use the rod itself to seat it. So I've got to get it all the way down to there without nicking the inside of this seal. So not only are we gonna you know, coat this in steering fluid to get it in, what I'm also gonna do is just run some electrician's tape all the way up here to cover those sharp edges up uh, and then we'll take it off before we put it inside. Okay, no sharp edges. We'll put plenty of fluid on the seal itself and I'll run some across the rack. Just got my hands dirty, I realized. Should've put my gloves back on, whatever. Okay, so now we can run that. And this will be tight, but better to be tight, tight on the tape than tight on those sharp metal pieces. There we go. Okay, so that's there and we're gonna slide this through and we'll use the whole bar to seat that nice and squarely in the bottom of the rack. This shaft has to be inside there by about three centimeters and then we'll know we're home. So first thing's gonna be get rid of this tape because this is not gonna be easy to remove later. And what I might do is, again, just to be careful, I'm just gonna tape up the end not the teeth, but just the end so that I don't end up scratching any of the bore with that sharp end there. Because just the end will be easy to get off later. Because it'll stick uh, right out this end. So I'm gonna pre-lube this. So we're just gonna get some fluid. It's all clean down there. Been cleaned many times, whoops. Trying to do this for the camera is probably not the right angle. But anyway, there we go. Slide it through. Now we're gonna hit, probably hit that shelf in the middle. Oh, no, made it through, cool. So just gonna be careful. Okay, that seal's gone through okay. All right, we're almost there. All right, so we've got that all the way through to the end. I'm just gonna orient it in the way that it probably should be. And uh, now we've got the one to go on the other end here. So to get this one, what I'm gonna do is just push the arm back towards me. Okay. And with it out a little bit like that, we can again wrap an end, cover this one in fluid, and spring, or the, the open side is going inside, all right, facing in, so the smooth is out. All right, so that's in there. And then I wanna drive it down to where it's gonna seat. Might throw it in the bias actually. All right, 
done. And even the drill marks on the aluminium nut line up with the holes we drilled before. So yeah, we should be uh, back in the same position. So we're done there. All right, now one of the things we still need to remember to do here is to stake this nut again. Obviously we drilled out the previous staking so we can't reuse that. So what I'm gonna do is just stake it on the other side. I'm not gonna do that now though. We'll do that as one of the last things just in case I mess something up here and I realize I need to pull it back apart. I don't wanna keep drilling holes. So we'll move on, but I will come back to that. So the next piece we're gonna to wanna to do is assemble the pinion valve body. We'll put this to the side for a second. So the pinion, obviously we've got the new seal in here that's been put in for us. And then we have the four Teflon seals that go on these rungs there. And then we have the upper pinion seal, which seals on this end here. Ooh, we'll go that way, on this end here. But it actually goes in the housing, not on the pinion assembly itself. So we'll put that one to the side for now. And we'll just focus on these ones here. Now these again are square cut seals and they're not particularly flexible, so they will be tight and they're a lot smaller than the seal that went on the rod, as you can see. Um, so you've got to be careful not to pull on these too tight and risk breaking them. And I don't have any spares of these, so if we break one of these, um, this episode will be delayed again until I can get more Teflon seals. Start by just stretching these slightly, just to get a little bit of heat into them and try to get my mind around how flexible they actually are. We're gonna use, again, a dental floss trick. So wrap it through. We're gonna lube up the valve body. Like I said, it's messy. It is what it is, who cares? We'll dip this into our fluid as well, so it's nice and lubed. And then hopefully this will slide over without too many struggles. So, Get one side in, and then with our dental floss, we can pull it out and hopefully just snap it into place. And it sits a little bit loose, so I think what I might do is, I had planned just to put this one on and then that one and then that one. What I'm gonna do is move this one all the way to the back and fill them up from the top down. I think we're good there. Okay, that seems to be sitting in pretty well. Um, yeah, gonna move on to the next one. All right, so all four of those are on. Uh, sorry about the shoddy footage um, for filming before. I've just looked at it, it's terrible, but anyway. Now it's on to the upper housing. So yeah, looking at the seal, uh, we've got the open section, which is gonna go uh, facing down, um, and we're coming in from the back. Now that's gonna go in up like that, and then the bearing is gonna go in behind it. They're gonna stack on top of each other like that. So the first thing I'd suggest is, um, we can seat this one by hand, and then this one we're gonna to have to knock in with a socket. And you wanna be able to tell once you've got it home, right? So you're gonna be looking through the top, and you just wanna see, if we can get close enough in on this, you wanna be able to see what the gap looks like between the inside of the rollers here and the inside of the rubber seal, so you can be confident that you've driven it all the way home. And there is a gap, and that's why I say take a look. You got a gap in there, it's maybe one and a half to two millimeters gap in between those two. Um, so important to get it pushed down so that it locates well and seals on the outside and the inside, but you don't want to end up crushing this seal in and uh, ruining any chance it's got a sealing anyway. And then we can literally just flip the housing over, drop the seal in, and then just push it down. You should find that you're able to push it into place just with your fingers. Yep, that's pretty good. Um, and then the bearing, and the bearing goes with the writing on the, uh, if you're looking down into the housing, the writing faces up. So I'm just gonna use a socket to knock it into place. So make sure you're knocking it in straight. All right, I think that's good. Then we're gonna get the valve body in there, so I'm just gonna run some fluid around the outside for lube again. Lube up the Teflon rings especially, but yeah, we should be able to slide this through. Try not to get it caught up too much. All right, it's rotating nicely. There's a, there's a reasonable amount of friction on this now. It, um, it doesn't feel like it's jammed or anything. It just feels like there's a lot of seals in there with tight clearances on. All right, so now it is time for the really messy bit. We've got some grease and uh, we've got to grease up the teeth along here and get some grease down in this hole uh, so that once we drop the pinion in there, everything will remain nice and greased. 
I'm also going to run a little bit of grease inside this bearing and just pack it in um, because there's not going to be, or hopefully if the seals work, there's not going to be any power steering fluid in this area. It's just the grease, so you can't expect it to get pushed in there with the uh, force of the hydraulic system. And I'm literally just going to spoon it in, get some on the teeth here. So you're going to just move it through the rack a little bit. A little bit of movement there. All right. And then with our bearing, just wipe in there as much as we can. Push grease in. All right, so yeah, full of grease. Grease on the shaft, grease all on the pinion body. As I slide this in, the gear needs to mesh up with the teeth. So you might find a couple of things. You might need to move the rack in and out, and you might also need to change the plane that the teeth are sitting on. So basically clock this one way or another to make sure that it meshes in with these gears and everything slides home easily. And we may just have grease squirt out everywhere here. I don't know, to be honest, but I'm gonna give it a shot. This may be easy to do with the housing off and put the housing on last, um, but we'll see. Just gotta make sure that I don't end up squashing the um, O-ring in a weird spot as well, because that needs to seal. Yeah, I might pop this off and just see what I can see. Okay. Oh, okay, all right. See there? Pinch the rubber O-ring under this, which is no good. That is unfortunate. All right, that's dropping in now. Sounds a lot better. Moving freely. Then I'll throw the O-ring on the outside. And I'm gonna have to wipe all that grease off. Apply some actual fluid back onto it just so that it assembles a bit easier. And hopefully this time this will slide down correctly. All right, that's the right way around. Throw our bolts in actually. Throw some Loctite on those. Yep. Probably a bit much. All right, so it's tightened down. I'll go back and retorque these with the proper torque settings later. So basically if I twist this, whether or not the rack's gonna move. Oh yeah, okay, it's actually really quite smooth and not particularly difficult, and I'm sure it moves by hand on the racks as well. Yep, now we're on to the preload area. So I'm gonna put some more grease down that hole. Not a huge amount, just a little bit. All right, so we've got the uh, nylon or whatever plastic it is runner here. We have greased the bar, we're gonna grease this. Make sure there's plenty of grease on that. Drop it in. Okay. Don't have to worry about getting too much on there because there is a procedure to tighten this and get the preload right that we're gonna to have to run and it will wipe that clean. Um, and then I'm also gonna put some grease just on the bottom of the spring and inside the cap, just so that those surfaces aren't running on each other. You are supposed to put some thread sealant on this um, and I am going to do that, but I've never tensioned one of these before. So the first thing I'm gonna do is just do a little test run and then I'll come back the second time around and I'll seal it up properly. Now, when we are testing this, there's a couple of things. So we've got a half inch drive to go in there and then we're gonna to have to measure the torque on this nut, the adjustment nut, and also on this top piece here. So checking the torque on that is going to be difficult. Um, if you mess around in your toolkit and you just try out different sockets, some won't fit. And sooner or later you will find one 
but once you lock it in, it actually does sit on the splines and then you are good to go. And the torque settings on both of those things are going to be very light. So what I've actually got is a torsion bar here or a torque bar. Um, and that's going to give us a very, very low range of torque. Uh, we are looking for about one Newton meter, a single Newton meter for some of these and five Newton meters at about the maximum, five, six Newton meters at the maximum. So, you know, a normal torque wrench, uh, like a half inch torque wrench that you're doing up your head bolts for is not gonna go down to that level or it's not gonna be accurate at that level. So you probably are gonna need something like this. I mean, you can just slap it back together and hope for the best, but um, I would suggest that that may uh, certainly shorten the life of the steering rack. Um, and to be honest, I've taken enough risks building this one as it is. Um, I just figured for the cost of a small torque bar that I'm gonna probably use again anyway, uh, it's not a big deal. All right, so with the rack clamped down, step one here is going to be to center the rack. And to do that, what we need to measure is the distance from the inside of this race here, get up nice and close, to the end of the steering rod. And that should be 68 and a half millimeters, I believe. Um, and we'll test that by measuring this one out at 68.5 and then measuring the other side and it should also be 68 and a half because that's going to be our starting point for making sure that we've got the right preload and we're setting all of the torque settings in the right spot on the bar. And for that first part, um, you can use, this is a 17 mil socket, right? And it sits over here and you get a reasonable amount of torque, certainly enough to do the final checks, but it will twist if you put too much on it. So. Before that, I'm quite happy just to set up a set of vice grips in the gaps. That shouldn't damage those teeth too much. Um, and we'll be able to move it back and forwards like that. So ruler in, hard up against that. We're at about 55 mil now, so I'm gonna take it out. And that there is 68 and a half mil. We check the other end. We've got about 71 there. So this might be a slightly different size than uh, what I was reading in the manual. There is about three different racks that have gone into R34s. So I am just going to rough that in and we're gonna bring that back around a millimeter. All right, so that's at 70 now and we'll just check this one. And we're at 70 mil there too. Now we wanna do the retainer adjuster up to somewhere between five and six Newton meters. I reckon you probably only want to try about five. It gets pretty tight. So I'll just zoom out so you guys have got a view of the torque bar. It's going to be pretty close to bottom out when we do this. All right, there we go. You can see we're starting to get torque onto it. Yeah, that's five there. All right, so that's pretty tight. You wouldn't ever run it that tight. We'll back it off. But for the centering process, the manual says not to back, well, it doesn't say not to back this off, but it doesn't say to back that off. So either something has been messed up in the Japanese to English translation, but we're gonna do it the way that manual says, or at least we think it says. What we're then gonna do is spin this in its full range of motion 10 times. All right, and that is to let all of the parts seat and sit in properly. So, you know, that's pretty tight there, but, it's not immovable. And certainly you really probably wouldn't notice with the power steering on, but what you would do is you'd be wearing out the pinion gear and also wearing out the, um, that plastic cup. All right, so we went probably more than 10 times there, but it doesn't matter. We're just looking to get, make sure everything's you know, seated in place and can move freely, which it is. So now we're gonna get it back to center. is close enough to there. And now what we're looking to do is find the tightest point in movement of plus or minus 180 degrees. Bring 180 this way. That's that there. Wow, so tightest pretty much on center. Just there. Yeah, okay, so that spot there, really right on center is where it feels the tightest. So now what we're gonna do is, we're just gonna back this nut off, give everything a bit of breathing room. 
Then we're going to do it up again. Take it back to that five Newton meters. All right, so we're getting close. So if you can see the torque bar here. See, it's just starting to register. Might need another one. All right, we're going up. Two, three, four, and then just nudging five. All right, so that's torqued right. Now what we have to do is back this off between 60 and 80 degrees. So I'm just gonna put a mark here and a mark there. So that would be the 90. So I think we wanna bring it round to sort of about there, I'm gonna say. I'm just gonna back it off. Finish up about there. Yeah, I think that's probably about right. Now, we're not gonna lock this off yet. Instead, we're going to put our socket onto here and we're gonna check the torque setting that it takes to move this. Now, the way the torque settings here work is anywhere across plus or minus 100 degrees. So that's not quite a full turn. So just over the 90, anything over that, your torque setting for it to move should be around one Newton meter. So not a lot at all, you know, one fifth of what we put on this. And then as you go further out, it can get up to about 1.8 Newton meters. I might just flip this around in the vise so that you can see the torque reading. All right, so we'll give that a crack. Looking to move it, let's just check it for a 90, but. All right, that is moving at about one Newton meter. Same back the other way. We're at just under a Newton meter, just under. All right, let me see if I can get you a better shot of that. All right. See, so we're just off the dial. About 0.8 to one Newton meter all the way around. All right, so I am pretty happy with that. We'll see if it gets any tighter as we go over that. Yeah, we are getting a little bit tighter. Yep, that's about 1.5. So now if I flip this back over, we just need to lock off the lock nut without moving the adjustment nut. And there is a torque setting for this, but I don't have a torque adjustable spanner. So I'm just gonna lock it off nice and tight. All right, that is moving nice and smoothly, nice and easy. I am pretty comfortable with that. Doesn't feel like anything's binding up or is going to prematurely wear out. All right, so yeah, I think we've had success there. Um, like I said, this was just gonna be my test run to figure out this process. Comfortable with it, now I need to undo this lock nut. Um, we'll put the sealant in there and then we'll re -talk it up. Five. Looking good. And now it's time to put our tie rods back on. So this is the driver's side one. Now, if you remember when we took these apart, we had these plates. These are very deformed after getting them off. There's two schools of thought here. Replace them with new ones. And I couldn't get those ones from Nissan, so I had to get these ones. The consideration here is that you're gonna add thickness and you're gonna space out the tie rods more, so they would need an adjustment because these ones have a hole big enough to slip over the end, so you don't add any distance. These ones, in order to lock in, you actually add the thickness of the washer onto it. So um, the second school of thought is you just ignore all of that, you put some red Loctite on this bad boy and you send it in and you move on with your life. I don't know, I always try to do things as close to factory as I can, so I'm gonna put the washer in and I'll use some lower blue Loctite to lock this in and then we just bend the edges over to lock that plate in. Hopefully it won't move around. All it means is that in terms of our steering alignment, those tie rods will be out an extra millimeter and that can be adjusted out in the wheel alignment. So I'm still gonna use some blue Loctite on this, just so it's got something. And yeah, we'll slip the plate over. And then the teeth of the plate obviously sit inside these channels. Yep, 
Yeah, see, that's the problem. I can't fit the uh, can't fit the spanner in. I could grind this down, I guess. Yeah, I'm just going to grind this down so it fits. I'm only ever going to use this spanner for this kind of operation anyway. All right, slight modification. Oh. All right, and that's going to be just fine. Now we're just locking these over. One, two, three, and four. All right, we should be good to go there. And now we have a genuine Nissan boot kit. That's the number there. And these kits come with the boot and they come with one of the wire ties. Uh, now these wire ties, once the boot's on and situated, you basically put it over and you pull it tight. Um, I find it's good to put a screwdriver in there. And then as you twist it, it'll close up onto this. So you're pulling it hard and putting the tension on it and then twisting it over. I don't really like these that much. They can be a bit of a pain in the ass. I'm just gonna set this to the side. Now they're actually a left and a right boot. Here's both out and you can see one is bigger at the top than the other. That goes on the large side here. Oh. All right. And then I'm gonna try and use a band, a proper band and a banding tool to uh, tie this in with a band rather than that bit of wire. And they, apparently they recommend that you double band these, but we'll see. Okay. One, two, and just for extra security, we're gonna bend this last one back. <clears throat> All right, that sucker ain't going nowhere. And on the other end, we just have these speed clips. And they are super simple to get on, as the name would suggest. Ta-da! And so our boot is ready to go and I'm just going to do the other end off camera. All right, so we've got the uh, tie rod end and the retaining clip on the other side. It's all locked tied it up. Now, before I put the boot back on, uh, if you remember, the one thing I have to do, I've got to stake this so it doesn't rotate loose as well. So we'll just do that now. Should just be one decent hit. And yeah, that little dot there should be enough to make sure that doesn't come around. Now this one for the boot, um, the back of the boot is going to basically cover up. You can see where the wear marks are, where the old boot used to be. And then for both sides, you're aiming to get this piece into this little relief there. That's where that speed clip should go to hold this in place so that when the rack is all the way extended, you're not over pulling this. All right, so get it in there. It'll mean squashing the boot up a bit, but that's the slot you're looking for. Oh, you see there? All right, that's good. Speed clamp in, we're done on that one. And I think I'm actually, uh, I may not have got the other one in the right spot. That's a lot more than I thought it was. So I'm just gonna go and check the other end. Yeah, nowhere near it. <laughs> okay. Oh, there we go. That's the lip. Yep, you can see the lip there. So we're in it nicely. And our speed clamp is on. Now it's time for our hard lines. So I'm just gonna make sure these are nice and clean when they go back in. So I've been sitting around the garage. The short one goes into the closest port of the rack, obviously. And our long one. All right, that's in like that. Now, my lines are in pretty good nick. You can get um, replacement soft lines if yours are rusty or bent or busted or whatever. Um, but yeah, I'm gonna reuse the originals because I like the OM look and uh, there's no point spending money replacing them if I don't need to. So yeah, now we'll just go through and tighten all the flare nuts up. Right, that is 99% together. Just waiting for the little feather in the cap, which is a dust cover. I'm just gonna try and line that up with that. I don't know if it's supposed to be, but whatever. 
All right, so we're cleaned up. Uh, the rack is on the bench. It's looking pretty good. Um, one thing I did forget to say, uh, apart from uh, talking those, I have talked those off camera, they're good. Um, this piece, uh, if you have the rack centered when you put this on, it'll uh, give you a good indicator of when it's back to center. Because obviously now that we've got the boots on, we can't measure for that 70 mil distance. So um, yeah, luckily I did put this together and it does line up. So we're gonna try and keep this centered so that when we put it back under the car and we have the steering wheel in a straight line, hopefully we can put those two things together and we won't have to take the steering wheel off and realign it. So it's back together. It's ready to go under the car. Um, it's centered. I do have two new bushes as well. So these are a super pro bush. That is the part number there to replace the rubber ones that came off. The rubber ones weren't in that great a condition. So um, standard things for these bushes, the super pro ones, which are purple. I would have liked to have had black ones, but I just couldn't find any. So super pro bushes, you lube up generously. Let's just say that. Now, obviously there's no movement from these mounts. These mounts aren't rotating like a bush or anything, but I don't want it moving around and potentially squeaking or accelerating the wear on these bad boys. So. Um, we will lube them up good and proper once we get them under the car. Super Pro bushes come with their own installation grease, so it's a very easy thing to do. Now, I don't know how long this episode would be at thus far. Uh, it's a bit hard to tell when you're filming them, so um, I'm going to film the reassembly, but if the video gets too long, I'm going to cut it out um, just because you've seen them taken out. You can just watch that in reverse to see it put back in. Uh, there's really not that many gotchas, so um, yeah, let's get under the car and get into it. All right, so we've got the rack ready to go in. And what I've done is I've just pre-lubed the bottom halves of each of the areas that those bushes are gonna go into. Um, they've been lubed on the other side as well, but I just didn't wanna lube them on the outside because you get all over your hands and it picks up dirt and stuff like that. So, and I'm gonna try and get it up onto there and get it hooked into this collar. The steering wheel is currently straight in the car, so this will give us the best chance we can, um, that I know of, of how to get this in and hopefully not have to adjust the wheel. So both of those lines are on and cinched up and I've also put the bolt back in the um, uni joint here. Uh, so with that, the whole system should be sealed and the rack should be stable. Obviously we haven't connected the tie rod ends yet and we haven't put the braces back on the transmission or the cover plate, but we should be able to start it now and that'll pressurize the system. Um, and that way if this thing's gonna leak like a sieve, um, which, you know, it, it's quite possibly could. It's best off to figure that out now before we put this whole thing back together and then fire it up and have it leak then. I'm just gonna fill up the power steering fluid reservoir and let it drain for a little bit. Uh, and then if nothing's happening in terms of getting fluid down here, I will fire it up and we'll use the power steering pump to pump some fluid through it. Okay, so uh, yeah, here goes nothing. All right, so fluid's topped off. Now when I start this up, I'm not going to move the steering wheel to start with. Uh, I'm just going to let the pump pressurize. We'll see whether it takes any fluid out of the reservoir. If it does, I'll keep topping it up until it doesn't take any more, and then we'll start moving the rack. Because I don't want to move the rack under power too much without uh, a bunch of lubricant in there. So yeah, let's hope this thing starts. All right, so there's a bit of squeaking there as the pump obviously ran out of uh, fluid. But sounds like it's bleeding. A lot of air coming out through there. All right, now I'm gonna try moving the uh, rack.
Out of fluid again. Oop. All right, we've blown some air through there and it's foamed right up. Hmm. Okay. I don't know if that's a byproduct of bleeding and having too much air in the system, but what I'm gonna do is let that settle because that's not what you want from your fluid. Um, and then I'll tidy it up and we'll come back. All right, so filled up this again. Um, basically what I did was I ran the engine. Um, it's a bit difficult to get it to want to run fluid through because remember for the, the, the role of the torsion bar inside this is to when the wheels have weight on the car, it'll power assist. So yeah, I basically had to spin it all the way to lock and then pull it and that would twist it enough to you could hear the fluid running through it. So yeah, what I'm gonna do here is, I think I'm gonna keep putting it back together, um, get it to the point where I can button up the entire underside, get it on its wheels, get some weight on it, and then I think we'll be able to bleed this thing properly, um, and then we'll know for sure, but so far so good. No leaks out of the rack or any of the lines or anything under the pressure that it's been so far, so I'm gonna keep my fingers crossed. All right, so we're back, and uh, this video was getting way too long, so we're skipping through uh, some of the superfluous stuff, but, the car is back in the garage on the ground. It is doing all the things a car should uh, and I am super happy with it. So um, I put it all back together. Uh, we did all the bleeding, it's had an alignment and since then I've driven this for about a week uh, and done two, 300 Ks on it and it has all been absolutely perfect. In terms of stuff I haven't shown you on that journey, um, just remember to put the right number of turns on the rack ends. Um, when this got to the alignment shop, it drove there well, but it was pretty far out. So don't think that you can um, always tell when your alignment's out just by the way that it drives. It was good enough to get down there and that was the whole point of that. But yeah, don't take yours out for a drive and if the steering wheel doesn't shut, I think that you're okay because you're probably not. The other thing on the bleeding, um, I did film all the bleeding, but the bottom line is uh, it's very noisy and uh, there's a lot of me running back and forth and very jerky camera work, so uh, it wasn't that great. The things to remember are, in terms of process, it's pretty simple. You're just filling the reservoir, have someone start the car or take the fuse out and let it crank over. Um, cranking speed is probably good enough to run the pump. Um, if you start it up, it's gonna drain the reservoir in about 0.2 of a second. Um, so you need to make sure you've got someone there topping it up. You don't wanna run your pump without fluid for any long period of time because it's gonna burn out the pump and then you'll be looking for an R34 pump and they're not easy to find either. But yeah, basically you fill the reservoir, you start the car, you keep filling it until it runs um, the fluid stable. Then I would say start moving the wheel from lock to lock. And when you get it to one end of the lock, if you give it a tug and just push it further than it would normally like to go, you will uh, sort of activate that torsion bar valve on the pinions and you'll hear it suck a whole bunch of air through and things like that and start moving the fluid around. Once you get it stable fluid wise, then put it all back together, get it on the ground. Um, hopefully you won't have any leaks, otherwise you've got to fix those. Um, and then just lock to lock with the weight of the car on the wheels and it will bleed through fine. When you're bleeding it, because there's so much air in the system, it may foam up the fluid. If it foams up the fluid, you just want to stop the car and let the air sort of settle out of the fluid and um, and then start it back up once it's looking good. So yeah, just keep that in mind. But honestly, the bleed procedure is not that big of a deal. So yeah, I'm really happy with the way this is all gone. There are a few things that I really want to uh, remind you guys of before we finish out this episode. Um, but right now my arm's getting tired from holding this camera. So I'm gonna put it down, uh, throw it on a tripod and we'll go from there. All right, so I made a bunch of mistakes on this job. Hopefully you guys aren't gonna repeat them because we've uh, shown them all on film, warts and all. Uh, but there are three things you really need to think about if you're gonna tackle this yourself. So first one is the ability to get the seal out of the rack itself. If you're not comfortable in making a tool to get that seal out yourself, then you should think about uh, potentially hiring one from your local indie auto parts shop. The third option would be to find a steering rack specialist that's willing just to pull that seal out if you bring in the housing. And that would tie into the second thing, which is that lower pinion seal. Now. You might be able to freeze the pinion uh, with some freezing spray and then press out that pin, or you might have to apply a bunch of heat 
um, but you've got to be confident that you can replace that pinion seal. Uh, that pinion seal, um, if it's not sealing properly, is gonna cause a leak uh, out of the um, side of the rack. So it's gonna basically push fluid into where we put the grease um, and fill up the boots and then eventually just spray oil out of the boots. So you've gotta be able to do that as well. And then finally is just a be careful on, uh, and that is be careful with uh, the removal of that aluminum gland nut on the end of the rack. Uh, obviously you saw me, I did it. I thought that the rack would expand. The S13s and S14s apparently have a steel gland nut, whereas uh, the 34 one is aluminium. So with those, you can just sort of brute force them. Uh, with this one, I took a bunch of threads off that nut and we're only really lucky that I stopped when I did because it is sealing up and holding really quite well. Now, while I was doing this, I actually found a 950 page R34 service manual at the 11th hour. I wish I'd had it when I started the video, but um, you'll notice at one point in the video, I start talking about a manual. I had found it and that's what helped me finish this out. Um, that manual says you should use a three mil drill bit and you should drill to about 1.5 mil in depth and that will take out the um, punched area so you can undo the nut properly. Yeah, if you're comfortable doing those three things, uh, I don't think this is a super hard job. You just gotta work clean and you've gotta be able to check all your torque specs and things like that. Uh, one thing that was also in the manual was if you are trying to check that torque on the top of the steering pinion, uh, they do have a Nissan special tool that attaches to the spline uh, and it is basically a steel tube with four bolts that you screw up. So um, you're literally uh, pressure bolting in on the side. So A, very similar to just using vice grips to turn it by hand and B, uh, that special tool I guarantee you is not cheap and probably not worth the money. So um, the 17 mil socket trick worked well. I did also think about um, just hot gluing it on and then just knocking it off later uh, and cleaning it up with a brush. That would have been fine as well. So there's plenty of different things you can do. Just be creative and you don't have to waste a bunch of money on special tools. So yeah, we are done and dusted with this one. Uh, next week, uh, like I said, I've driven this about two, 300 Ks. I think next week's episode will be me trying to fix the auto trans on this because it is doing some weird and wacky things, um, shifting when I don't want it to shift and things like that. It could be the solenoids. They are uh, something that does go out on R34s. Um, but I also don't know what kind of service history the auto trans on this has got. And JDM cars are famous for not really having their maintenance done well. So um, if you've ever tried to flush an auto trans, uh, we are gonna put new filters in this and simply dropping the pan and putting new filters in, you're not gonna be replacing the majority of the oil. So we're gonna go through the special process uh, that I would recommend you use to make sure you clear out all of the trans fluid and you can get some good stuff in because dodgy trans fluid can actually make autos do really, really strange things. So we wanna make sure that we've got good fluid uh, and it's to the right spec and we have decent um, filters in. All of that results in no change to the auto. Um, I'm probably not gonna change the solenoids because I think they're about 700 bucks. Uh, at that point, we're probably just gonna manual swap this thing. So yeah. More content on the 34 to come. We also have a couple of weeks that I'm gonna spend on a separate project. While I've been trying to sort all this out, the turbo blew on my other car. So we're gonna be doing a turbo replacement on that and then painting a few things on it because it's got a few car park scratches. And then it's probably going up for sale um, to make some more room in the build room. Um, and then we are gonna do some more first gen stuff very soon. So stick around for that. I appreciate you guys' patience with um, uh, how long it's taken me to get back to the Celica stuff. Uh, the 34 needed more work than I really thought, um, but I will get back to it soon and also appreciate your patience in watching such long episodes. So yeah, if you're new to the build room, there's plenty of other good content. I will link to the full Violet Crumble Celica episodes up here and I'll link to some other good content just down here. Um, other than that, I wanna say thanks for watching and I'll see you next time on the build room. Bye for now.